Good morning. I'm Bill Fallon, the chairman of the board of the Naval Historical Foundation. I want to welcome you here to our NHF Second Saturday program. It's a pleasure to be able to introduce today's topic, which is going to go back to the era of the Vietnam War, encompassed uh, uh, over a decade of time and, and many different aspects. Uh, today, we're not going to do the whole thing. Uh, we're going to focus on the Brown Water Navy, if you would, uh, the effort that was largely conducted uh, in and around the Mekong Delta in the southern part of the country. Uh, but first, a uh, little bit of background uh, in terms of how we got into this. Uh, after the uh, French were uh, defeated uh, and left their colonial empire, or at least the part of it in Southeast Asia uh, that was uh, Vietnam, the country was divided into the North and the South. The communists uh, took over the North, and the South uh, was uh, left uh, pretty much on its own, except for the reality that the communists uh, had a vision of uniting the entire country again under their rule. And so uh, they bided their time for a short while, but then began to send teams of infiltrators uh, into the South uh, to stir up the local folks and to try to win converts to their side. And all this time, uh, slowly but uh, steadily sliding manpower down from the North uh, to be able to start and maintain an insurgency in the South. So the U.S. Uh, got involved uh, in a small way in the 50s, uh, gradually increasing uh, the watermark event uh, was, uh, I think most historians would agree, was the so-called Gulf of Tonkin incident that occurred in the August of 1964 up in uh, the coastal area off the city of Bin in the north. And the upshot of this was that uh, uh, there was uh, an alleged attack on U.S. ships, actually a couple of events over a couple of days period, but the the event that, that really uh, resulted in a strong U.S. reaction was a, a second evening of what was believed to be at the time uh, North Korea, North Vietnamese patrol boats uh, coming out to attack the U.S. destroyers off the coast. In hindsight, uh, we've discovered that that second event never did really occur. It was a combination of uh, uh, lack of understanding of uh, radar technology, mistakes, errors, and in some cases, uh, uh, convenient uh, for the time, uh, failure to provide all the information back to Washington. But the upshot of it was uh, the next day, the U.S. conducted airstrikes against uh, targets in the area of Vin. And uh, from then on, uh, things began to escalate in a, uh, in a stop and start manner, but uh, gradually, the North Vietnamese increased the tempo of ops in the South. Uh, we began to strike back. And then a little bit later, the next year in 65, we landed significant numbers of troops ashore in the area around Da Nang and a, and a buildup started. So uh, meanwhile, in the Southern part of Vietnam, the Mekong River, which comes out of uh, Tibet and the Himalayas uh, flowing down through China and through the countries of Southeast Asia, ends up, uh, the geography is important here, it disperse, disperses into a number of winding waterways interlaced with canals and rivers and so forth. Well, this area in South Vietnam was very important to the country, uh, first of all, because it was home to almost half the population, 40 some percent of the people lived down there. And the second thing, very important, it was called the breadbasket of the country because it was the prime rice growing area and other crops. And so it was really important. And the, the communists in the north uh, put a premium on uh, targeting this area and trying to uh, convert uh, the area one way or another to their side. So as the U.S. gradually increased its involvement in the war, uh, the Navy ended up, uh, along with the Coast Guard, with the responsibility for this southern part of the country. Because of the intricate system of waterways, it wasn't really conducive to large uh, troop forces. And so the Navy uh, primarily uh, getting around by boat, by small craft, uh, ended up 
taking over most of the responsibility here for the transportation of uh, small units. Uh, there were certainly some Army units that uh, operated down there. Navy SEALs were, uh, were a major uh, piece of this with combat teams all over the South. And the Navy gradually increasing the number of small craft uh, in Navy terms to hundreds and, and uh, up to a thousand uh, boats uh, through the late 60s and into the early 70s. And so uh, there was a major part of the conflict going on here. Initially, the, the Communist North made attempts to uh, infiltrate men and supplies coming by sea from the north uh, down the coast using fairly large uh, craft. The Navy began to intercept these operations, uh, primarily uh, in an operation known as market time, and uh, began to interdict these, uh, these craft pretty successfully to the point where the North pretty much gave up on steel hulled vessels, went to ocean going junks, which also didn't have a whole lot of success. And uh, again, from 65 on, it became pretty difficult uh, for the North to infiltrate uh, much into the South. There's another operation along the coast known as Sea Dragon. We're not going to spend much time on that today. Uh, the focus really on market time and the Navy and Coast Guard, uh, SEALs and Army forces that uh, maintained their operations in the Delta uh, for the remainder of the war. So um, Task Force 115 uh, was market time. Uh, the next operation, Task Force 116, known as Game Warden, uh, began in 65. And then uh, sequentially, uh, another operation, Task Force 117 in 67, uh, became uh, uh, gradually kept increasing the pressure and I will say, uh, we'll leave it to the, uh, the historians to give us the details, but uh, my uh, memory and experience is that over, by and large, the Navy was quite successful in uh, halting the major interdiction of arms and materiel into this region. Uh, there were still uh, lots of firefights, uh, lots of battles with insurgents, uh, but uh, not uh, large force units. Uh, the Army uh, joined forces with the Navy uh, in the brown water down there uh, later in the 60s, uh, and this uh, so-called riverine force of the Navy uh, expanded to cover pretty much all the waterways. Another aspect of this, uh, it was recognized pretty, pretty early that the forces would need air cover, uh, both to support the vessels and the troops that were engaged in combat and also for logistics, but primarily for air support. And so two unique units were stood up. Uh, one was a helicopter uh, light attack, Squadron 3, HAL 3, the Sea Wolves. And the second, uh, uh, about a year later, a different kind of aircraft, uh, the OV-10 Bronco, and the squadron that uh, operated those machines down there was uh, VAL-4, light attack, uh, Squadron 4, or flying the Broncos. Not particularly numerous, uh, maybe a dozen and a half or so, uh, each kind of craft operating at a time, but very, very successful in, uh, in protect, helping to protect and support the forces that were involved in the rivers. A little bit later in the uh, 1970 era, late 69, 70, as the communists uh, pretty much focused on moving their supplies by land, they would come down through Laos and through Cambodia and so along the Cambodian Laotian border in the south, where the river was not only the demarcation line, but there were many waterways, uh, the last major operation was put in place uh, known as Sea Lords. Uh, Admiral Elmo Zum Zumwalt was out in Vietnam during this period, and he, he pushed this uh, very hard. Now, the bottom line was that the Navy, again, was very successful in, in holding off any uh, large successes by the communists. For example, during the Tet offensive, um, where cities and towns throughout the country were attacked, uh, it didn't last very long in the South. It was pretty much a fundamental failure for the North. And uh, that was due in large part to the maritime riverine forces that responded very quickly and beat that back. Uh, from that time forward, uh, the Navy was primarily engaged in, in the Coast Guard in turning over responsibility for the majority of these activities to the Vietnamese 
It's the so-called Vietnamization of the war uh, went very well. The Vietnamese Navy uh, picked up things pretty quickly. The U.S. Navy and Coast Guard turned over the majority of their vessels to them, and by and large, uh, the Vietnamese were successful in maintaining uh, the general security in the Delta region uh, until such time as we abandoned them and, uh, and they were left on their own and the North uh, came pouring in and, in the mid-70s. And the Delta was the last area that the North ended up being able to take over. So it's a, it was a fascinating time, uh, lots of interesting activities. Uh, the Navy kept very busy. It was tough fighting. Uh, there were many heroes and many sailors and Marines and soldiers and airmen that were just doing their job day in and day out, but by and large uh, did it in a very, very admirable manner. And uh, we owe them a lot of credit. And to hear more about that, we'll have the rest of this program today. And I'd like to turn this over to Dr. Sherwood for the next uh, stage of this. Thanks very much for joining us. And I encourage anyone who is watching that's not a member of the Historical Foundation yet, please join us, sign up. I think you'll find it fascinating. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Sherwood. Okay, my name, my name is John Sherwood. I'm with the Naval History and Heritage Command. And today I'm going to be talking about U.S. Navy coastal and riverine warfare in Vietnam. Um, on this first slide, I just want to point out that is a monitor with River Division 91. Today, my main focus is on riverine and coastal warfare, and that fell under an admiral who was known as the Com Nav 4V, Commander Naval Forces Vietnam. This was the first uh, Com Nav 4V, Admiral Norvell Ward, who was a submariner, actually, uh, with uh, extensive combat experience in submarines in World War II. Under him were the three major riverine and coastal task forces, 115, 116, and 117. Naval support activities. Naval support activity, Da Nang became the largest overseas Navy logistics command with over 4,000 personnel uh, when it peaked. It, um, that piece of the of the comnav 4 v pi naval support activity was actually the largest piece there were more sailors who served in that function than in the combat task forces uh, the naval advisors also fell under the comnav 4 v as did cbs which grew from a battalion in 65 to over 10,000 sailors they built a, a large number of bases they improved roads, they built bridges. Uh, more than 174,000 sailors served in country between 1960 and 1972. The success of market time led to the formation of a second task force known as Task Force 116, Game Warden or the River Patrol Force. And what what happened with after market time was established was that the the Viet Cong shifted their supply system inland. So supplies were now infiltrated uh, down through Laos and Cambodia, and then uh, the up through the upper Mekong River from Cambodia to the Mekong Delta and other and other parts of Vietnam. And uh, so it was it was decided that we needed a river marine interdiction force as well. But the mission was going to be a little different. It was not a total blockade. What it was really designed to do was to keep the Viet Cong from using the main shipping channels. And I will show you those shipping channels, the Ba Sok, Cochin, Hamlong, Mita, Sai, and the Saigon River. Keep them from using those channels and keep those channels open for the U.S. and its allies to, to use. Five divisions of, uh, were deployed, each with 20 PBRs, patrol boat river. Uh, some of these PBRs were based on land, such as this slide of Sadek, and you can see them rafted up. 
land bases were usually co-located with Vietnam Navy bases. Uh, so we worked with their forces as we did during the market time operation. And there was also riverine basing. basing. This is uh, Westchester County, an LST, LST 921. And as you can see, the PBRs are rafted up against the LST. And there's also a helicopter, uh, heli light, Navy light helicopter gunships were employed, part of a unit known as HAL-3. And they were the eyes, the ears, mobile firepower, medical evacuation. Uh, they did a lot of everything, uh, but they were instrumental in protecting the force, making it, it was never a safe job, but, it may, but making it safer for those uh, brave sailors who risked their lives in PBRs. And it wasn't safe on the LSTs either. Westchester County was, <clears throat> was mined in November of 68, we think by uh, Viet, Viet Cong who had received training as frogmen in the Vietnam Navy and then, uh, and then switched sides. Uh, they mined the ship and uh, the, the result was 18 sailors killed. YRBM-16, which is a non-self-propelled barge, was mined on Thanksgiving evening in 67, killing uh, seven sailors and wounding 14. Those were huge tragedies for the Riverine Force, some of the largest single, uh, single episode loss of lives situations. Here's a PBR searching sampans. Uh, the Riverine Patrol Force had mixed results. There was absolutely no way that 120 PBRs could patrol every waterway in the Mekong Delta. There are over 4,000 miles of navigable waterways. Uh, what they did do is they did secure those main shipping channels. That was key. They frustrated a number of major Viet Cong crossings, one on 31 October 1966 by Bosun's mate, first class James Elliott Williams. Uh, huge victory. He, he received a Medal of Honor for the action. Many, many people killed on their side. And uh, air power was also an important piece of that action, HAL-3. Uh, and there were other PBRs, PBRs involved as well. So the final task force that was employed was the Mobile Riverine Force. And the Mobile Riverine Force was developed to support General Westmoreland's idea of big unit war search and destroy operations. And they, it was a marriage between the Navy and the Army designed to root out uh, large formations of Viet Cong in the, in, the, in the Mekong Delta. And the question was, well, why didn't we work with the Marine Corps? They're our, they're our natural brothers. Uh, and the reason for that is the, Na the Marine Corps was pretty, pretty much uh, tied down, not tied down, but uh, they were pretty busy in, in I Corps up north, and uh, and the Mekong Delta was a an army operational area. So we worked with the army. We worked extremely well. Uh, the boats employed were up armed, up armored, converted LCMs. They had monitors, command and control boats, Tango boats, which were armored troop carriers. I, I will let Tom discuss the technology in greater detail. Uh, there was an army component, which was a brigade of the 9th Infantry Division and two river assault squadrons. Uh, the command relationships were quite interesting. At, while, while, the sh while the unit was on the rivers, it was commanded by a naval officer. This is a picture of Robert Saltzer who later became the commander of Naval Forces Vietnam, a distinguished World War II veteran as well, and Colonel Burt David with the 9th Infantry Division. The, the Navy and the Army built a huge base at Dong Tam. We, we brought in one of the, the biggest dredger in the world at the time, the Jamaica Bay, which was attacked and which James William, uh, James Elliot Williams actually responded to that attack and helped defend that, that uh, dredger. 
We dredged 600 acres of wetlands north of Mita. You can still see it today. It's a, it's a, a, a fish sauce factory now, but you can, uh, if you visit, uh, I encourage you to go up there. There's also a bridge. They built a bridge there, uh, which is, which was remarkable. So, uh, but not then. Then the only way of getting around was, was, was on the water. And there's a huge turning basin. One of the things with the MRF is they, these LCMs move slowly and you had huge tides, currents, and other, other issues to contend with on the rivers. So timing was critical that you had to be, in many cases, you had to get under a bridge before the tide rose or out of a specific area before there was no before the water was gone. So uh, it required a lot of uh, careful, careful planning. Uh, we also employed riverine bases, um, just as TF116 did. The, um, the results were impressive. This unit killed more Viet Cong than any other inshore unit. This is an alpha boat. I won't even say anything about the alpha boat because it's one of the most interesting boats developed in the war, and, and Tom will talk about it. Uh, suffered the highest casualties. The boats, the not the uh, the LCMs proved vulnerable to B-40 and B-50 rockets, which were anti-tank rockets that the Viet Cong started using against these boats. But in the end, and this is a flamethrower, a Zippo monitor, a flamethrowing uh, monitor, saved the Delta during Tet. Uh, the during the Tet offensive resources were stretched extremely thin. There weren't available helicopters to move a lot of people, to, uh, a lot of infantry to besieged towns. So the MRF was able to get uh, troops to where they were needed, such as Mita, Ben Trey, Ben Long, and Canto, and not only get them there, but provide organic firepower, provide logistical support, sustain those troops while they're, while they're operating ashore, provide medical support. There were medical boats. Um, essentially everything one would need with a mechanized infantry division, except the mechanization was did not consist of tracked vehicles or wheeled vehicles. It consisted of boats. So the key to success of the MRF, mobility, firepower, logistics, all the major towns in the Delta were accessible by rivers and the, and the wonderful integration between the Navy and Army personnel. To this day, the Army and Navy personnel from that union have reunions together. There were such close bonds forged between the two services. And if you want to learn more about the Brownwater campaign and learn more about some of the people who served in that campaign. This is my book. It's available for free as a download on the NHHC website. Thank you very much. You know, many times when I talk to people about the fact that uh, I was in Vietnam, I sometimes get the response, uh, oh, I thought you were in the Navy. And uh, <clears throat> that uh, illustrates something, the fact that uh, the Navy's role in Vietnam is not that well known. I think the air war certainly was with the POWs and that sort of thing, but, but the in-country side of it uh, is, is not very well known. And of course, as uh, John pointed out in his presentation, there, are, uh, uh, there was a lot more Navy going on than just the brown water part. So we're, uh, uh, we're only focusing on a very small aspect, and yet I think it was an important aspect because I think the Navy was given some missions to, to uh, perform in Vietnam and they, they, in fact, I think it's fair to say, did perform those and in most cases did, did pretty well in my estimation. Um, they're really, I would say there are four main components. I, I'm gonna be focusing kind of on the, the combat uh, uh, aspects, if, if you will, um, with this Brownwater Navy and, and as John pointed out, the Greenwater part as well with the Coastal Surveillance Force. But the four components were the, the Coastal Surveillance Force, uh, and then there was the river patrol force 
And then on top of that, there was the Mobile Riverine Force. Now, those are two different things, and we'll talk about that in just a, a minute. John, John's already covered that to some extent, but I'll elaborate a little bit on that. And then, of course, there were the advisors in Vietnam, and they also uh, were playing some pretty uh, significant roles, uh, particularly at the beginning of the war, early days, and then in the end days when we started turning things back over to the Vietnamese during the, the uh, turnover Vietnamization part. The next mission that comes up, of course, is the is the River Patrol Force, and this was codenamed Operation Game Warden, also known as Task Force 116. And this came about because the Mekong Delta is such an important part of, of Vietnam. It's the rice basket, if you will. It takes the, the Delta itself takes up about a quarter of what was then South Vietnam, um, but uh, housed over half the people and and played a large role in supplying rice to the people. The problem was that the rice wasn't getting to market because the Viet Cong was intercepting it on the waterways and confiscating it, uh, calling it tax collection sometimes, sometimes just outright piracy or whatever. But they were they were stopping the flow to the markets and we were starting to have to import rice into South Vietnam, which was ridiculous considering how much they were producing. So the Navy got called upon to fix this problem. And they, in fact, did that by creating this this. Uh, game warden force, which operated, as John pointed out, by from LSTs going up the rivers, and then eventually permanent bases were, were established along the various rivers um, uh, in, in the Delta. Again, the Navy didn't have a craft, didn't have something to, to, to do this with, you know, big blue water Navy, but we weren't ready to go into the rivers, so they had to come up with something innovative. And what they did was they adapted a, a recreational craft a fiberglass recreational craft that was only 31 feet long and again converted it into a combat craft by mounting uh, two uh, a twin 50 machine gun up forward and then uh, back aft having uh, different combinations back aft it depended uh, on uh, the boat captains to a certain extent and the mission that was there they would sometimes uh, do different parts of what was interesting about these craft was the fact that they were um, propelled by, not by propellers, but by water jets, and they were made by the jacuzzi company. The jacuzzi pumps would actually put out a water jet that could propel the craft, and then they also would turn those jets for the steering, so there were no rudders either. So the jets were actually moved uh, one, one way or the other to, to turn the, the craft. They were very maneuverable as a, respect, uh, as a result. They turn within their own um, diameter and at high speed. Um, to, to affect uh, backing down, they just lowered a U-gate uh, over the jet so that the jet was now uh, going 180 from what it was before, and that's how you got your stern propulsion. Um, as I mentioned, the, 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 the weapons that you see on the uh, on there were the twin 50s up forward and then back aft, sometimes they would mount, there were pencil mounts back there you could put uh, M60 machine guns or grenade launchers or various other things. And again, it depended on, on the boat captain what and the mission that they were called on to perform, how that happened. Now, these craft relied on three things. Uh, one is, well, there are three things that can protect the ship. One is armor, one is uh, uh, speed, and the other is firepower. And in the case of the PBRs, the, they did put cer some ceramic armor on those craft, but they didn't... Uh, uh, it wasn't very effective uh, because of uh, it would only stop low caliber and eventually the, the boat captains mostly would remove some of that ceramic armor just because it uh, was weighting down the craft the um, the other element of course is speed and that they had plenty of but also always keep in mind that you can't outrun a, a bullet so um, these, these crafts sometimes were, were hit particularly by rocket fire and that sort of thing um, the other thing, of course, is maneuverability, and that can help in, in, the, uh, in the combat situation. And again, uh, the craft can rely on that. Now, sometimes you'll see pictures of, of PBRs performing, uh, going along in a formation there. That, that's a PR stunt there. The truth of the matter is that uh, uh, PBRs didn't travel in that way, but they always, virtually always, travel in pairs. Uh, if you see the movie Apocalypse Now, there's a, a cardinal sin there because you have this one PBR uh, going by itself and in fact they pay the penalty in the in the tactics later on as you see when they stop a sampan. Uh, the reason they 
would travel in pairs is that one of them would be checking sampans on the river or, or you know, somehow occupied. Uh, and the other PBR would be patrolling around watching the six, you know, making sure there wasn't an ambush or that sort of thing. So they, they definitely uh, would uh, support each other. And that's why you always want them to be in pairs. As I said, the missions they performed was to stop sampans, just routine search to make sure they weren't smuggling weapons or, or other contraband. They also uh, would do some fire support missions, um, helping out SEALs in some cases, um, uh, Army troops and others and so forth, but they, they were very capable of, of doing that as well. And then they also went on night patrols and enforced curfews. There were curfews to keep the bad guys from moving on the waterways and the PBRs would in fact um, do night patrols as well. Um, John had mentioned earlier HAL-3, the sea wolves. These were an important component. Um, if you're on a PBR, they can become your best friend in, in, in a firefight. Uh, helped a lot, as, he, as John mentioned, with uh, the James Elliott Williams incident um, on the, uh, uh, in the Delta there. Uh, by the way, about Williams, an interesting guy. I interviewed him uh, when I was writing my book, and uh, and he was a fascinating character, or whatever. And I'll never forget when I asked him about why he, you know, he went in this in the waterway uh, with enemy forces all around and so forth, penetrating there, and and he's going in guns blazing and so forth. It's a fantastic story. Um, and I asked him, well, you know, some of the effect of what, what were you thinking? He said. Well, well, there weren't no exit ramps, so we just kept on a coming. I'll never forget that line. It was, it was beautiful. But anyway, the how how they did support him in, in, uh, in, in that particular operation played a key role. One of the things that the, the good uh, PBR captains and uh, officers in charge would would uh, do is is uh, catch a ride on these occasions, go up and, and survey the Delta area from the air, and that helped them understand the waterways a lot better, uh, give them a, a bird's eye view that was very useful at times. Um, the, um, another group came in later in the war and they were the uh, Val Four Black Ponies, they were called. And these were army hand-me-downs. Uh, by the way, the, the, the HAL-3 uh, helos, they were hand-me-downs from the army as well. Uh, Hueys from that the army was no longer uh, using, they gave them to the Navy and they were flown by Navy pilots. Val 4 was the same thing, except these were OB-10 Broncos from the Army, and they also perform, performed fire support missions and so forth for the river forces that were there. Um, the other force, and this sometimes caused some confusion, we have the River Patrol Force, but we also had the Mobile Riverine Force, Task Force 117. And as John already mentioned, this, this came about because the Marines were pretty well occupied uh, up in military region one and when it became clear that that we needed to get some troops on the ground into the delta um that the and the army wanted to get in there and the army of course travels on wheels or, or treads normally and in that delta there were very few roads so they there was a marriage made in heaven here where the army and the navy got together and created this mobile riverine force and what would happen is they had these motherships that were actually converted lsts uh they were called apbs um and they would form the nucleus of this thing, and then all the, the support air uh, support craft, this uh, small craft, would would moor alongside in the middle of the river, and the troops would actually live aboard the LST or the APB, excuse me. And uh, so that was that was kind of the arrangement. Now, to, to accomplish the mission, they had a number of craft, and these are very interesting. These are converted lcm sixes from world war ii landing craft and you can kind of see the similarity there in the picture there's a, a bow door um, that drops down uh, at the appropriate time you can see also that there's a uh, an awning over the center place that's where the troops would be down there uh, a platoon of troops would be down in the in the well deck there and the the awning protected them from the sun and also from lobbing grenades and so forth uh, they're going to some pretty narrow waterways there so that came, came in handy the other protection they have is you see all that bar armor on there. And what bar armor does is it pre-detonates uh, incoming uh, B-40s or rocket rounds are coming in. Um, if by pre-detonating, they still <clears throat> blast and so forth, but it's a lot better than penetrating the hull and going in there where the troops were and so forth. So, so that was a big help as well. Uh, the armament on this varied somewhat. There were 20 millimeter, 40 millimeter, 
there were some machine guns on occasion, and some of them got creative. There were flamethrowers. I think John mentioned that already. Uh, sometimes employed um, in various other means of, of uh, providing firepower. Speaking of firepower, they also had another adaptation of the LCM-6. They took off the bow door. This is still an LCM-6, but they took off the bow door and reconfigured the bow and came up with a thing called the monitor. Um, this is kind of the battleship uh, of the fleet, if you will, for the for these uh, landing troops that are going to go up the rivers. And, and uh, you got a, a 40 millimeter up forward there. There's down in the well deck, there's a, a, a naval mortar. And again, more 20 millimeters uh, arrayed around the thing. <clears throat> Later in the war, they actually brought some howitzers and mounted them in uh, on some of these as well uh, up forward. So they were pretty well armed and they could, could do a uh, provide some pretty good support. A variation on this was the CCB, and this looks a lot like the monitor, except that down the well deck, instead of the mortar down there, you have a bunch of communications gear. And the uh, the Commodore in charge there could, could ride in that CCB and coordinate the operations that were going on. The last craft that was part of this flotilla was the ASPB, um, which uh, stands for uh, Assault Support Patrol Boat. These were the only ones, the only riverine craft that were built from the hull, uh, from the keel up as uh, as actual patrol craft. They were created for for this purpose. They kind of functioned as both. A, you might see them as destroyers or as minesweepers. They were capable of, of both missions, and they they came along a little bit later, but they were very valuable and, and very effective uh, in the operations that were conducted. The way these operations worked is that the the uh, the flotilla would gather up the troops, would get on board and so forth, and then get underway and they'd head up the main river and then head for the smaller waterways. Um, once they get into the smaller waterway, the craft would beach and uh, drop their bow doors, and that would allow the troops to disembark and go on patrol or go uh, do an assault or whatever. Um, the Navy's role during any one of these operations was, one was to support, provide fire support if it was needed, uh, sometimes the Navy would go around to ad adjoining waterways and form a block there so that the troops who were advancing forward could drive them in, a, in an hammer and anvil type of, of tactic. Um, again, they uh, they also would provide the logistic support. If the operation was going to last several days, these, these craft could ferry back and forth, bringing uh, food and, and uh, medical supplies and whatever else was needed. One of the most amazing parts of this thing is the world's smallest aircraft carrier. These are not Photoshop. These are for real. There were actually helicopters landing on a flight deck that had been mounted on onto uh, these craft, and they could actually uh, take out casualties or bring in needed supplies or whatever. Um, pretty amazing stuff. One thing I, I mentioned didn't mention at the beginning. There was another operation which was uh, called Operation Stable Door, and I mentioned it uh, because it, it played a fairly significant role, and, and also my very first patrol in Vietnam was as part of this, so it, I have a little bit of a, a whatever. Um, Stable Door was guarding the, the harbors, uh, patrolling the harbors and trying to protect the, the ships. There were lots of merchant ships bringing in tons of supplies into the various harbors at Da Nang and, and uh, uh, other places in, in uh, South Vietnam. And we would go out on these patrols at night um, uh, sometimes just in Boston whalers, uh, sometimes larger craft were used, but uh, just basically going around the harbors and dropping grenades. And uh, and if, if they there were sapper swimmers coming in trying to plant mines on these ships, which they did fairly often, and uh, it was successful. And we had some some uh, bodies washed up on the beach, and, and it was clear that those grenades had rearranged their organs for them. Um, and that was, you know, kind of mundane stuff in the way, but at the same time, it was important stuff in, in, the, in the long run. Late in the war, um, a new thing occurred called Operation Sea Lords, and that's a, a rather labored acronym for Southeast Asia Land Ocean River Delta Strategy. Uh, this was uh, Admiral Zumwalt's baby. Um, he uh, came up with that acronym. And when Zumo took over as uh, Commander of Naval Forces Vietnam, he came in and he found that the morale was kind of low on uh, among these forces, that we had pretty much swept the, uh, the bad guys off the river, so the river patrols were just boring as hell going up and down uh, with very little to do. Uh, 
Um, things had settled into a kind of a doldrums, if you will. And he decided it was time to rethink this because there still were a, there was a lot of enemy activity, particularly in the Delta, where they were moving, even though they weren't using the major riverways, they were still using the smaller waterways and going, uh, moving troops and supplies around uh, uh, rather freely. So what he did was he reorganized things under this Task Force 194 Sea Lords and brought the swift boats into the rivers, uh, com made up uh, groups of, of combined swift boats, ASPBs, PBRs, you know, all these different crafts started operating together and then penetrating into the smaller waterways. Um, you can see from these pictures uh, that, that some of this was pretty narrow stuff. Some of these waterways uh, were so narrow you couldn't even uh, turn around in them. Once committed that waterway, you better hope there's a way out at the other end. So anyway, um, this uh, was a more aggressive strategy. As a result of that, casualties went up, but so did morale. The troops were, were feeling that they, uh, they belonged. Um, uh, we're doing a, a mission, an important mission for the first time, uh, not first time, but uh, again, I guess is a better way of describing that. And that's pretty much the, the uh, a summation, quick summation of what was going on in Vietnam with these various forces and so forth. Um, I would point out that um, that you know this is not a, a huge commitment when you think about it. The peak strength when when there were half a million troops in Vietnam, there were only uh, about thirty eight thousand in the in the so called uh, brown water forces. Um, at the but at the if you total up all the people that served in these forces during the war, it comes close to two million. Uh, there was about a million uh, eight hundred thousand and some of us who went to Vietnam and served in these various forces. Um, casualties, there were 200, excuse me, 2,663 Navy casualties and seven Coast Guard that are attributed to this. Now, not all of those were on the river in, uh, or coast, but most of them were a large percentage were. And that pretty much uh, sums up, uh, as I said at the beginning of this, uh, not very well known there were people uh, navy people in vietnam serving in these roles uh again i would reiterate i think the navy was given missions uh showed that adapt uh, adaptability and carried out those missions one can argue how effective the missions were but the missions were in fact carried out and i think that that's a good way to end this talk Thank you, Admiral Fallon, Dr. Sherwood, and Commander Cutler for your thorough introduction of Brownwater Navy operations in Vietnam. This morning, we have a very distinguished panel, including Dr. Sherwood and Commander Cutler, whom we introduced via our Thursday Tidings publication this week. We had a, a very thorough rundown. We had uh, Vice Admiral Robinson's uh, uh, Navy Cross citation, pictures of him as a midshipman from his lucky bag, as well as, uh, as uh, Dick Krulis. Um, and, uh, and so to, to introduce them uh, in, in a little bit less of an elegant way, their Vice Admiral David B. Robinson, who was awarded the Navy Cross, as mentioned, for his service as commanding officer of the USS Cannon, patrol gunboat 90, during operations in Vietnam. Next, we have retired Captain Richard Krulis, call sign Krulo, a Navy football player of extraordinary uh, talent who served in helicopter light attack squadron PAL-3. And we could, we could and we will dedicate an entire webinar to HAL-3 and VAL-4, who were mentioned by uh, Admirals Fallon and, and uh, Commander Cutler in the future, but a true coverage of uh, Vietnam brown water operations really cannot be accomplished without associating HAL-3 uh, with any and all other combat capabilities. We also have then Lieutenant Junior Grade Roland Kidder, uh, who distinguished himself brilliantly as the leader of the World War II Battle Monument Commission, a very important uh, role and contributed to the World War II Memorial here in uh, Washington, DC. His Vietnam service in the Brown Water Navy will add great value to our discussion. 
gentlemen, thank you for joining us and let us begin. The first question for the entire room is what did you think of, uh, in, when I say uh, entire room, just the three, uh, Vice Admiral Robinson, uh, uh, Dick Krulis, and, uh, and Raleigh Kidder, uh, what did you think of the comprehension discussion provided by our opening speakers? Admiral Robinson. Well, I found the uh, historical context um, very, very helpful. And, and anyone who's served in a war zone knows his little lake are pretty well, but understanding the entire strategy and the entire um, uh, range of operations, I found very helpful. Uh, Krulo, Krulo, what do you think? Uh, I agree with the Admiral. The um, thing that I found um, most amazing is um, how we all work together. And actually, while we were there too, um, we would, and it was mentioned, um, we would go out on the PBRs. We would go out on some of the uh, patrols and vice versa. I had many times the uh, sailors and uh, boat captains riding with us in the helicopter. Very interesting times. Yes, sir. And uh, in Raleigh. Uh, yes, I would say in addition to what Tom Cutler said, I think if you read history, it's, uh, the Vietnam Riverine Force operation was probably the biggest uh, river involvement of the U.S. Navy since the Civil War. I mean, you don't, when you read uh, Sherman and Grant and find out what the Navy was doing in the West and the rivers, uh, this was the next big one and as far as I'm concerned. Um, I would like to just say one other thing about Tom Cutler who talked about the PBRs. I was a patrol officer on a PBR. And I think the operation of, uh, it, of stopping and searching the sandpans of opening waterways for commerce, we were quite successful at. We, we were a hit and run type of boat. If we got shot at, we, our defense was our speed, excuse me, our maneuverability. Uh, when they put us up on the Cambodian border and border interdiction, and especially when they separated us from our uh, cover boats up there, we were really not very well suited for that. And uh, especially as the water went down, we'd have to put a machine gun on the beach and because we couldn't see over the dike lines. And so, you know, that's uh, getting into the weeds a little bit too much, but it was a great uh, overall coverage, I thought, of the U.S. Navy in Vietnam. Great. Let's uh, let's get to some questions of interest from our uh, prestigious audience, and we're so happy uh, that you chose to spend your Saturday morning with us today. But for Vice Admiral Robinson, please share the mission of the USS Cannon and other patrol gunboats, and if you don't mind, the circumstances of the attack that wounded you and surrounded the events detailed in your Navy Cross citation. Well, the, uh, the the PT boats were uh, the PGs were uh, commissioned ships. They um, uh, they originated in concept right after uh, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Maybe was looking for a fast uh, destroyer, small destroyer type uh, that could help in things around Cuba. And then, of course, the uh, conditions in uh, Vietnam came into play. Um, there were 17 of these uh, ships built. Uh, they were about 250 tons, about 165 feet long, a crew of about 34 officers. They had a three inch 50, a 40 millimeter, four 50 caliber, four M60s and various and sundry small arms. Um, uh, the first turbine powered ship in the U.S. Navy. They had a combined um, um, engineering uh, setup that had diesels and a um, gas turbine, or the same gas turbine in the uh, F-4 Phantom. Uh, we could do 35, 40 knots, um, and we could do that for about 350 miles before we ran out of gas. And so we spent most of our time um, on diesel. We were far deployed, uh, we were home ported in Guam, half of us, and far deployed to Cameron Bay, where we did uh, market tying ops up and down the, um, the coast, both the east and west coast of uh, Vietnam. And then we provided fire support 
and seal and search support um, up the Bode Kulon rivers down in Four Corps. Um, the cannon uh, had a couple of uh, exciting fights <laughs> and, and uh, made good use of HAL 3 and BAL 4 assets. They were great uh, to our, our benefit. Uh, and the day that uh, we were hit the worst, we were escorting supplies up, uh, we were escorting a supply ship up to sea float. Uh, so you see that sea float at least with a nice melding of the blue water Navy and the groundwater Navy. Uh, great. Is there anything more you want to say about the actual combat action that, uh, that saw you receive a Navy Cross, but you had, I think, three Silver Stars, five Bronze Star recipients. You had 14 wounded uh, that, I, that I could just recollect just from my own research. Uh, was there anything more you want to add about that? Being well, humble uh, as you were. There was another uh, Navy Cross awarded that day to uh, Lieutenant Steve Herbert. Um, the, the thing about it is the PGs have been operating up and down that river for two uh, at least two years, and um, the Viet Cong were not dummies, and they had uh, attacked in the early days by just putting these RPGs on a on a stick on the riverbank and firing them remotely, which was very ineffective. Um, the, the attack that that you are referring to was the first time, in my knowledge, that it was coordinated. Uh, manned weapons from both sides of the river. Uh, we were we were hit from the starboard bow and in the, in the port quarter. Uh, hit at least eight times with um, B40s and and I don't know how many small arm hits. Uh, but it but it was a sophistication we had not seen before, and um, the tactics that had been developed in the past were inefficient uh, for this type of attack. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Krulo, um, HAL 3 and the Sea Wolves were brilliant in service in Vietnam. They were quick, responsive, supportive, and deadly. Can you describe the general mission of the squadron that would see over 2,500 Navy personnel serve during HAL 3 service? Uh, where were you distributed around the theater, and what was your general mission on a daily basis? <laughs> That's that's quite a few questions. The 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 one thing that we took pride in in, in HAL three was if you needed a helicopter, we were there, and um, we did fire missions, we did medevacs, um, we did close air support, we did um, PBR protection up the thing. The thing that was so great in in my mind was that we had ten detachments. And we all were spaced within four core. And we had specific areas that we knew by the back of our hand. When you were a rookie, you sat in the seat with an experienced pilot to your right or left, depending upon where he wanted you to sit. And you were learning and you had a map in your lap and you knew every single uh, point along your area of operation by the time you got to be an aircraft commander and then it then would progress to you became a fire team leader but what this meant was that where i was stationed which was debt five up in chow duck we were um from chow duck to ha tian along the vintay canal that was our primary operating area and by the time you were an aircraft commander you didn't need a map. Yeah. Someone would give you the six digit coordinates, X-ray Sierra, da, 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 da. You would jump into the airplane and you could fly right to that point. So um, this was such a unique experience, such a uh, different, <laughs> by the way, when I say different, I didn't learn it was different until um, I got out of that squadron and went to uh, peacetime squadrons and was surprised how 
Um, yes, you called everybody by their rank and this and that, the other thing. And in HAL 3, everybody had a nickname um, because you didn't want to be operating or e ever have to go down and someone says, Lieutenant, and you answer and then they shoot you. So uh, it was it was quite a, uh, an experience. And um, we would all work together, enlisted and officers, servicing that aircraft and responding and acting like a team. Um, it was quite an experience for a young Lieutenant JG. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll have more questions for you now. The, this is a question really for the room, but I'm going to start with Raleigh Kidder. And it's, it's fascinating because we've had really two uh, questions about it. And um, the first one is uh, from Lieutenant John Carwile, Naval Academy, uh, class of 76. And, uh, and he asks, aside from all the allegorical heart of darkness by Conrad's references in the movie Apocalypse Now, is there anything realistic about the life and action portrayed about the small boat? And of course, in the book, it was the PBR street gang. And, uh, and then uh, our board member uh, and dear friend of the foundation, Matthew Bergman asks in a related way, how was the historiography of the Brownwater Navy impacted by the depiction in Coppola's Apocalypse Now? So I'm going to start with you, Raleigh, and kind of work around the room, including uh, Tom Cutler and John Sherwood. Well, I think Tom Cutler referred to the fact that in the movie, uh, the PBR was acting alone, and in most of the operations, uh, we needed a cover boat, which would have solved some of the problems. I thought that the movie uh, was surrealistic in the sense that some of the things we did uh, were sort of condensed all happening at the same time. Yes, we had water skis we could pull behind a PBR, but you didn't, uh, you did that in the daytime. The the attacks, when they when they had the attack in the movie, for example, the water skis in the daytime and the attack in the daytime, no, the, the fighting was at night. So Coppola had sort of separated everything out 12 hours, but the kind of operations we did, uh, you can say, uh, were somewhat accurate. I mean, one of the things I think about the movie, there was a loudspeaker with music going on. Well, we had a loudspeaker for PSYOPs uh, that we'd uh, drift down a river with, hoping to uh, incur the enemy's wrath so he'd open fire and knowing that HAL 3 or somebody else was over the next tree line waiting for this to happen. So, but it was at night. It was not in the daytime and all happening at one time. So uh, it was, there was some surrealism, a lot of it in the movie, but in some ways, there were the functions that we did were well represented, I guess you could say. Yeah, just uh, rhetorically, was it Wagner or rock and roll? Uh, uh, Admiral Robinson, what, uh, what, what do you uh, think of that question? Well, I, I, my uh, uh, observation is, is pretty limited because I didn't operate with PBRs. We operated right. with the Vietnamese, we operated with PCS. Um, and then we operated in the um, offshore. So I really had very little um, contact uh, with the PBRs and, and some of the bases that were, were explained earlier in the presentation. Yes, sir, Crillo. I had mute on there, sorry. Uh, I have to laugh. Um, when I heard the thing about the PSYOPs, one of our favorite tricks on, on Det 5, if we were going out at night and, and we wanted to get some location, we would take that PSYOPs player, and it was a big bank speaker, and hanging out the side, and we'd play Ring of Fire by Johnny Cash. <laughs> and I swear, every time we did that, we would draw fire. And the... Um, trail aircraft would roll in with flechettes and we would record kills. Uh, Tom Cutler, comments, you're smiling. <laughs> well, who, who wouldn't smile at that? Um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the movie and that at least people made people aware that there were PBRs and the Navy was, was there and that sort of thing, so that's good. Uh, there were some, some real, I thought, some practical errors. They, they come alongside a sampan, 
They, they tie themselves off to the sampan, which you certainly wouldn't do. They shut the engines down, which you certainly wouldn't do. Uh, and, and again, th there was a, a number of things that uh, would make not good good examples, I think, of good tactics in, in that trail. Yes, sir. And then finally, Dr. Sherwood, thoughts? I think one of the things that the movie emphasized was that the, that the enlisted force in the Brownwater Navy had agency. The boat captain, my memory serves me, was enlisted, and many of the boat captains in the Brown in Task Force 116 and 117 were were enlisted. James James Elliott Williams was a bosun's mate, first class. Many of them weren't even chief petty officers. Some of them were East Sixers. So that's that's one aspect. The the air power aspect was another uh, part of the movie that sort of gelled with with real life. And finally, the sort of the intelligence piece, uh, the Brownwater Navy worked very closely with SEALs, uh, Navy SEALs, and also Navy liaison officers. And they often engaged in intelligence missions. So they would do infiltration and exfiltration with the SEALs. They would take an ILO somewhere to interrogate a prisoner captured by uh, uh, the, the South Vietnamese Army. And I would say finally, the Army uniforms, you, you saw a lot of that in, in real life. Thank you. Yeah. No, Go thank ahead. you very much. We have a question from a, a person I consider to be a legend in the surface warfare community from the class of 57, Bill Perenboom. And among other things, I believe he commanded the, the cruiser Wainwright, but he was a god on the waterfront in, in, when I was a J.O. I mean, we walked reverently past him and our salutes to him were as sharp as possibly could be executed. But he asks, um, uh, all three really, the, the three principal panelists, what was your experience, if any, being mothered by market time ships? And it's kind of an interesting, uh, you know, we didn't really get into the market time but there were a lot of great ships out there, and were they giving you um, ice cream? And were they, you know, were they giving you spare parts? You know, can you comment on that, please? And we'll start with Admiral Robinson. Well, it, it it's good to hear of Bill Perrin, but I hope you're doing well, Bill. I haven't seen you for many years. Um, the uh, you know the 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 market time off. By the time we got over there, the trawlers were long gone. Uh, we did a lot of sand, sand pan, um, uh, sand pan work, um, but the real, uh, the, the real effort we did was at, with market time, sea float uh, um, on on the Kulon River down on Nankan was uh, uh, CTP one sixteen point one, and uh, that that was our primary uh, duty in in that area. Yes, sir. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, do you have any recollections, Raleigh or, or Krulo, with uh, any market time uh, ship support in any man manner of shape? For, or well, my understanding, was the market time guys were operating primarily on the coast, weren't they? Right. And, uh, but um, I had gone on a market time operation once when I was uh, my ship was at uh, Cameron Bay, and I was trying to decide whether to go to Vietnam or not. I decided I got so seasick on a PCF, I didn't want to be out at market time so that's when i got on pprs uh but um the, the the seagoing navy of course was very supportive with lst support on the rivers and right and uh, offshore and you know it, w it was always out there i mean and, and but uh, right and immediately we didn't see much of it yes sir uh tom cutler uh, and dr sherwood any thoughts uh, beginning with you tom No. <laughs> okay, fair. And Dr. Sherwood, thoughts? Did of Coast Guard personnel and Coast Guard boats, so there were WPBs and high endurance cutters. And if you go to the Coast Guard Academy and you look at the Hall of Heroes, you'll see many uh, Coast Guard graduates who were WPB commanders who who were involved in these trawler intercepts. 
I would also like to say that market time often engaged in naval gunfire support for troops in contact on the ground, sometimes brown water Navy, but many times uh, Arvin and US, and US Army. And they were also involved in under, undersea replenishment for small boats, mostly their own, the, the WPBs and the, and the PCFs, but on occasion, uh, other types of riverine craft. So they served uh, a variety of roles and command and control as well. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the Navy gunfire support role. I know that uh, a lot of the frigates uh, perform magnificently. One that comes to mind is the USS Lockwood. And I think their CO was Bob Woods, JJ Gershon was the XO, Bill Keating is the WEPO. And I think they melted down Mount 51. And, and I think that, uh, you know, they sort of abandoned uh, safety. And I think they had uh, ordnance on deck, you know, because they just needed to have it because they were just pounding the heck out of the beach, uh, you know, the entire time. Uh, but uh, to, to, to take this just one step further, one of our audience members, uh, Mr. Shiner, uh, you know, is there anything more you want to say about the Coast Guard? Because I thought, you know, I think sometimes we underplay, you know, the, the participation, but also the heroics, bravery and success of, of Coast Guard support. Uh, yeah, I'd like to say that Every single uh, WPB commander was a Coast Guard Academy graduate, and that has a lot to do with the fact that the Coast Guard Academy is the main commissioning vehicle for the Coast Guard, but also the fact that the Coast Guard really wanted to send their best people to Vietnam uh, because they were going to play in a, in a larger theater with, uh, with the Navy. So they want they sent their best people, and many of those individuals ended up uh, at the center of some of the most significant trawler intercepts during the war. So they performed very admirably. Yeah, and, and uh, thank you very much for that, uh, Dr. Sherwood. So we have a, an, an audience participant, Edward Meralda. And he asks a great question, and it's it's something that's you know really we think about a lot. Uh, how effective was the Vietnam Navy in the fight for the Mekong Delta, or said a different way, and especially to the three operators really here, uh, what was your experience working with the uh, South Vietnamese uh, the Navy? Uh, Admiral Robinson first, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, not at all. Uh, before I answer that, I'd like to uh, piggyback on on Dr. Sherwood's uh, comments. Yes, sir. Uh, a, a future commandant of the uh, Coast Guard, Admiral Yost, uh, also operated down the same river I did, and he operated down there uh, in basically this, uh, with the Navy and the Navy seal, uh, SEALs and uh, doing doing everything the Navy did. So they, they do have a wonderful uh, untold story. Um, but uh, Working with the South Vietnamese Navy, uh, I didn't trust their capabilities. They never came to our support. There was a LSIL standing, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a mile away when we got hit and they never came to our assistance. And there were just too many stories about uh, the COs of those ships uh, not willing to go into the battle, stars uh, were aligned. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. Uh, that really frank uh, assessment. Uh, sometimes we don't hear it that frank. Uh, what, what was your experience, uh, Carullo? Well, I I didn't have any real experiences um, at the macro level. We were there in 1970 and we were dealing with the uh, Vietnamization issue and we were actually flying um, Vietnamese Arvin forces uh, who would sit in the back and they were, quote, in, in what I was told, uh, be going to become helicopter pilots, et cetera, et cetera. And they wanted to get um, experience in the helicopter. Now, the good news was is they didn't weigh much, so we took them along. And they actually were a help sometimes when we had to um, 
deal with Arvin forces, and then we would put them on a handheld radio, and they could talk to the people on the ground. Um, other than that, there was very little uh, interplay from the standpoint of uh, HAL-3 and um, Vietnamization, because um, they never took over our squadron, and uh, they never did fly our helicopters. Yes, sir. And uh, Raleigh, what was your experience? Did you work uh, alongside them in any manner, shape, or form? Well, let me just say that uh, the uh, Vietnamese forces, uh, some were good and some weren't so good. I guess the militia outposts on the Vinte Canal, for example, were not well-trained soldiers and were not very reliable. On the other hand, I trained a Vietnamese Navy Lieutenant J.G. Tutrang Van, and he was terrific. I mean, he'd slug it out and stay with the fight. And when the, uh, actually the war ended and two came out and we met again here in New York State and he got his feet back on the ground with his family and he's retired now. But he, his take on the Navy was, is that they were the, they were still fighting fairly strongly in the Delta the night the, the country fell to the communists. He said, we got to, he said, except we didn't have as much ammunition and support from the Americans after the Congress began to cut that back. But he said, we were still fighting. We were holding our own. But uh, the night they fell, he got a 90 minute notice that uh, Saigon was going to announce a surrender at midnight. And we got to decide, are we leaving, getting on a mic boat and going to the South China Sea, which he decided to do. So my, uh, few of the, Navy, of the Vietnamese Navy is I think they, uh, in the Delta, at least in what Tu was doing, uh, they were holding their own and they were, uh, had, had, with the resources they had, were still fighting hard at the very end of the war. So um, others may have other opinions, but I'm telling you what his view on it is. No, thank you for your perspective. And I think it's important to, to get it at boots on the ground view. But at a, in a historical view, you know, Tom Cutler, John Sherwood, uh, what are your thoughts? What's the, you know, what's the voting? How does it vote out? You know, did what Vietnamization, did they participate? I mean, I think we heard from Admiral Robinson, his experience was uh, was not so much. What, what are your uh, historical views for, for posterity? Tom. Yeah, for, um, historically, uh, I think one of the things that we sometimes overlook is that the uh, we came into the war, the Vietnamese had been fighting forever, you know, uh, in one shape, one way or another. And the Americans came in and typical, there's some typical American arrogance. Okay, I got this and I'm here, we'll, 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 we'll handle this. And the Vietnamese in many cases were willing to say, fine, I'm, you know, I'm tired, you, you handle it. Now that's, that's a generalization. But, uh, but I also think that in my personal experience, I, I, I knew some uh, really impressive uh, Vietnamese naval officers, and I knew some uh, were not so impressive, and that's kind of true in, in, in any any navy, any any circumstance. Uh, I, I ended up in my career the last uh, couple of months. I was down at Vietnamese naval headquarters, uh, operating, uh, uh, working closely with, with uh, people there, and and generally I was I was impressed. Uh, I think that the efforts at Vietnamization were were genuine and uh, trying trying to make this thing work, even though not everybody agreed with it. Right, and Dr. Sherwood. There were a couple instances where the enlisted people um, were working with the Vietnamese and, you know, you're working around the airplane and you're hearing the conversation. And one of our gunners, I, I don't remember who it was specifically, you know, was talking with the Vietnamese uh, gunner who was learning how to to uh, operate in the helicopter and what well, you know and they were talking about it and i remember that vietnamese young man saying all we want is the fighting to stop period they they were they were sick and tired of all these years of fighting and that that really stuck with me that that's a great perspective uh dr sherwood um, well, the, the Vietnam Navy improved over time. It, it was organized a bit differently. Part of it was a, called the Coastal Force, was a militia type Navy that actually employed junks 
including sailing junks early on. Uh, fast forward to Dumwald, he replaced a lot of those junks with fiberglass boats called Yabuda junks. And the Vietnam Navy went from kind of a nascent Navy that really was leaning heavily on the US to a Navy that was able to make a successful incursion into Cambodia in 1970, was able to fight a battle in, uh, in the South China Sea with the Chinese, was able to evacuate large numbers of civilians at the end of the war. And don't forget, as people emphasize, many of these officers spent their entire career, 10 years fighting uh, on the rivers compared to the average Navy tour, which was one year. So I think we need to give the Vietnam Navy a bit more credit uh, than, you know, than we do. Yeah, Roger that. Um, and, I, and I thank you for that perspective as well. Of course, a, a person's perception is their reality. And when, uh, you know, when you're, you've got ordinance raining down, you want some help and you want it now. And if you don't get it, you know, you have a different reality. So, but I understand and I appreciate the, the perspective. We have a real dear friend of the foundation who's, uh, who asked a question from Germany and uh, he never misses one of our events, uh, Jörg Schimmelfenig. And uh, his question, and, and he's a really doctrinally sound historian and he does a lot of research in, the, in, the, uh, in, in our, uh, our, our libraries and uh, when he gets, when he's able, not not in the pandemic, to visit. But uh, in order to develop tactics, you know, one needs time, and I think we all understand that. Was the Navy ready to conduct groundwater Navy warfare, say in '65, or did they just have to learn and develop tactics, uh, techniques, and procedures on the fly? And uh, is there anything that that you could say about that? And I'm gonna I'm gonna really ask uh, that really more for anything. Tom and, uh, and and John Sherwood, but others can jump in if they have thoughts on that on that uh, the answer to that. Uh, Dr. Sherwood first. Yes, they had to learn learn a lot at, on the job, so to speak. The market time was something that the Navy Navy knew how to do well, a blockade. But when it came to operating on on the rivers and engaging in amphibious operations on the rivers, that was something that had to be relearned, so to speak. Yeah, you, yeah. anything else I interrupted you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just wanna say greetings uh, to, I have a few friends in Kiel, Germany, so greetings to them. Thank you for that. Now, Tom, uh, in addition to that question, uh, I, there was a question from Mick Fulkerson, great question, uh, asking you to mention the heavy SEAL support craft and uh, his recollection that, and, and, and I think it's uh, uh, right on, is only two were ever built uh, on old LCM six hulls. Uh, slow, but very capable. Your thoughts on both questions. And you may be muted. Yes, I was. <laughs> um, on the latter question, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't know much about that. Um, that's one area that, that I never got much information on other than what you just said. Um, on the other thing, you know, the, the uh, uh, John Sherwood's uh, co comment about the uh, market time and so forth, I think that's, that's spot on. The um, thing that uh, amazed me about uh, the Brownwater Navy is that if you look at the people that the enlisted people, for example, that were involved in in the, the uh, Brownwater operations, they were they were some they were cooks, they were postal clerks. I mean, and there were plenty of gunners mates and and bosun mates. Don't get me wrong, but it was amazing how there was an awful lot of people that were there, and that was largely part uh, due to an awful lot of more volunteers, and they wanted to do something different and to participate. You know, we we thought of Vietnam. This is the front line, and and. If I'm a, a warrior, I'm going to be there and that, that sort of thing. So I think that that contributed to it as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we have a, a member in the audience whom we really appreciate his input, and it's less a question, more a share. But uh, Tom Phillips, uh, from, from a Seawolf background, uh, makes the following comment. In 71, the Vietnam, Vietnamese Navy had relieved the United States Navy 
And, uh, and in his perspective, the, uh, Na our United States Navy was aggressive, whereas the Vietnamese Navy was more defensive in portfolio. And his Det-9 Seawolves had one pilot and one gunner for training, and they flew in the seats as crew. And of course, the pilots he suggests were very good. The gunners uh, needed some work. And, uh, and then he just observed that he had never heard of anything like an army attack on a village of civilians and children. Uh, you know, and I think that's the, uh, the uh, Robert Duvall part where, uh, where the ride of the Valkyries was being played. Uh, he said, great Hollywood, but unreal. Uh, anything you wanna say about his observations? I have a, a comment, I can make one on that, but your previous one about tactics, Yes, sir. One of the things that made HAL 3 so very, very effective was that I learned my tactics from guys who had spent flying 500 missions prior to me being there. And we tried to engage the enemy in ways that were not the same. We do it one way, one day, a different way the other day still being effective because the number one driving force with us out on detachment was do not be predictable and that is a big difference from the way that natops trains you the way that the navy was operating you always did it the same way you had procedures you had this and we found out that in the type of guerrilla warfare that we were fighting, we had to be unpredictable and still stay within parameters of being safe and efficient, but not knowing um, what we were going to do uh, time and time again and being repetitive. Um, that was the biggest thing that I learned uh, going there because you just came out of the training command. You always had your procedures. You always did it the same way. And as soon as I sat in that seat in HAL 3, the guy was saying, okay, we're doing this within these parameters, but we don't keep doing it the same way. So uh, we had a brilliant, in my opinion, brilliant conversation uh, earlier this week. And, and there's two things I'd like to ask you to embellish. The first was that you talked about um, you're out on a mission and then you, you find a rice paddy. And of course you only flew at night. We're gonna talk about that. But uh, you, uh, you landed and turned off your, you know, turned the, shut the helo down. And, and, and the idea was that your ingress to a response would be from a different direction. So please kind of take that thread and, and, and embellish on that. But the second piece of that, which I thought was, uh, was, was really unique was the, uh, just the, the, the whole idea of, um, of your, your own asymmetrical, you know, uh, manner of, of, of doing business. Well, the first one, we didn't do that very often. That was more of an incident where, yes, we did that a couple times, but one night we would be at Vinjai. One night we might be at Hatien. Another night we might be at Chow Duck. Like I said, we did most of our work, but we would come, and, and by doing that, you were always coming from a different direction. You can't sneak up on somebody in a helicopter. <laughs> we all know that. Everybody has their memories of the old wop, 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 wop. But it does help you out. And then that way, you, you know, you have a, a canal. A canal runs east to west and there's a north bank and a south bank so the, those points on the compass are fixed but you can attack from different angles if you're coming from a different angle and by doing that um you would be quicker to some points and and they could not set up ambushes because they didn't know where you were so yeah, that was you, that was. Can uh, you embellish just on the Navy's ability to fly at night versus the Army's uh, lack of ability to fly at night, for lack of a better description? Oh, it's it's quite simple. We were instrument trained, and they were not. It's that simple. We had an instrument card. All right, so you had to fly under the hood. You had to be on instrument, et cetera, et cetera. 
They didn't. They were VFR, visual flight rule pr training. Army training was, you know, you see what you you see everything out visual. As soon as that doesn't happen, they were restricted. We weren't. Yeah, uh, one thing one thing I want to mention, and this is just the moderator's uh, privilege of just making a comment. Uh, I want to talk about uh, Tom Brokaw wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. And I, you know, I admired the book and I love the generation, but I put you guys in the same boat. I really do. And, um, and like my patron saint in my church uh, spouses two uh, ethos, one is obedience and the other is humility. And I think that, uh, you know, when I look across, uh, you know, dear friends, Greg Hansen, Bob Natter, Patrick Sabaty, Steve Smith, uh, Gordon Peterson, Mike O'Hearn, uh, Brian Bazell, Denny Rowley. I cruised with Denny Rowley for a year and a half, and I never knew he was in HAL 3. It's just not something you guys brag about. You saw Admiral Robinson earlier today refused to talk about uh, a personal decoration, uh, and, and that's who you guys are, and I think I speak for the entire room and for those who are in the room who uh, also served uh, you know, the, the, those who didn't serve their admiration for you is equal to anything that Tom Brokaw ever mentioned about the greatest generation from World War II. So I just want to put that out there to you. And then, uh, and then as we kind of get to a place where we're winding down a little bit, I want to talk uh, just some, some other kind of house cleaning questions. Uh, Denny Fargo asks, uh, what are the panelists' views on the potential demise of the Navy's Mark VI patrol boats? Uh, any thoughts on that? And only, you know, if you have an answer, answer. If not, just let it go. I, the Navy, our Navy, has never really learned how to operate small ships um, in in uh, in the blue water uh, environment, and and so it's not surprising the PDs did not last an awfully long time, and it's not surprising uh, the Mark 41 would be kind of way soon. Other, other thoughts, uh, Tom Cutler? Yeah, um, interestingly enough, you know, the, the Navy pretty much abandoned the, the, the uh, brown water function after Vietnam and gave it away, and, and the Marines came along, and they're always looking for any mission they can grab onto. And the Marines took it over for a while. And I was actually called in to, to uh, uh, some of the meetings in Monaco and so forth about how do you do riverine warfare and that sort of thing. And then years later, um, the Navy decided to take it back again in Iraq. And once again, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to relearn all this sort of stuff. And I, I just wish the Navy would embrace this as a permanent part of what we do and, and uh, and make viable career paths through it and so forth. So I think that there's, there's work to be done there. And, and I, I find it sometimes, I find it encouraging that we're at least doing some of that, but discouraging that we're not doing more. Thank you. And then uh, Mick Fulkerson, who mentioned, who had a question before an observation, uh, asked just generally about mobile support team two, and they ran the boats for the SEAL teams one and two in the Mekong Delta. Any thoughts on their mission, uh, their work, um, any, anything that comes to mind from any of the panelists? Yeah, I would like to say that uh, as far as the Vietnam War and the SEAL community, this was really a proving ground for a new concept in naval warfare. Uh, the SEALs were basically created around the same time as the Vietnam War, and it, and it became a place where they honed their skills and, and techniques. And you, the SEALs had their own boats, but they often used the, the PBR as a, as a means of getting into and getting out, out of ambush sites, etc. And sometimes they used their own boats and PBRs would support them. So there was a very close-knit relationship between the SEALs. They were often in the same bases. And so off-duty, the SEALs and the, the brown water sailors hung out together. And during the Tet Offensive at Mitaw, the SEALs were instrumental in defending that town, which came under, under siege. 
and actually giving instruction to NSA, Naval Support Activity sailors who weren't, weren't accustomed to getting involved in firefights saying, you know, here's, here's a gun, here's what you do. Uh, and they, they successfully motivated a, basically a group of yeomen to successfully defend the base during the Tet Offensive. So that was, that was really an incredible uh, story. The SEALs posted snipers on top of a barracks building and, uh, and, and were, were incredibly successful in that fight. So yeah, important part of the war. Thank you. And uh, I'd just like to ask uh, the three panelists, the three principal panelists for the live session, uh, and beginning with Admiral Robinson, um, any final reflections as we, uh, as we end this really wonderful webinar? Anything you'd like to say to the audience? Uh, any comments that we didn't ask you? Uh, feel free, open forum. Uh, any, any final thoughts for you, sir? Well, I, I, again, I want to piggyback on Dr. Uh, Sherwood. Uh, the SEALs down at Sea Float, uh, there was three teams down there, and, and they were the they were the tip of the spear down around the Bodet and the Kulon River area. Wonderful, wonderful troops. Uh, no, I, I really don't think I have anything uh, more to, to add to this esteemed group. I would um, just mention that for those who are really interested in getting down into the details, the um, F4V monthly um, reports are very detailed, very interesting. To my knowledge, they're all on the now. Uh, I forgot where you get them. Um, but, but I found those of benefit. And if there is anyone who's interested in learning more about patrol gunboats here in the Vietnam era, uh, there's a website called um, uh, gunboatfighters.com, I think it is. And, and there's a lot of information there. Yes, sir. Thank you for that. And of course, we had some real surface warfare heroes, command patrol gunboats, George Sullivan, Bob Williams later commanded uh, Cannon, uh, Gordon Rhines from Vern C. Clark. Uh, we might have heard of him. Uh, and so there were some really stellar uh, folks uh, that, that uh, served in those important jobs. Um, uh, Krulo, I, 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 as you give your final reflections, do you mind adding your views on the Sea Wolves uh, PBS special that came out, uh, and just uh, share with us your final thoughts in addition to that documentary. Well, I love that documentary. I think I've bought um, six uh, DVDs um, and passed them around because so many people didn't know uh, what we did. And I think that one of the things that's very, very important is to realize how the um, team that was out on detachments worked so well together and that a lot of credit has to be done, uh, given um, to the enlisted guys. You know, people say, oh, they are maintainers. Uh, I'm sorry, the guys that were out on debt, not only were they the maintainers, the AEs, the ADJs, they were also the gunners and they saved our butts as much as I as a pilot saved their butts. I mean, those guys were excellent shots and some of the things they did, jumping out of the aircraft and rescuing people and dragging them back into the helicopter while we were under fire. I, you can't um, believe the um, number of stories. They're unbelievable. Yes, sir. And I, you know, I feel your emotion. And of course, we all, uh, any, any person worth their salt knows that the backbone of our Navy are our strong enlisted. And uh, it's always been that way. It'll always be that way. And so thank you for uh, highlighting and elucidating their uh, maybe undersold story today about their contribution. Uh, and uh, Raleigh, any any final thoughts from you, sir? Well, uh, I've been notified my battery's a little bit low, but I hope I uh, can stay with you for the end of this. Um, you know, I had a chance to go back to Vietnam in 2010 because this gentleman I mentioned before, Tu Trung Van, was visiting his 
family there, and he was uh, my interpreter and guide. And we went down on these old rivers in, in the Mekong Delta. And there, of course, there's highways to them all now. There's electricity down there. There's a couple of suspension bridges that are, look like uh, the Golden Gate. So you don't have to bring up uh, your uh, produce out of the Delta by waterways. You get on a highway, and a lot of it's a four-lane highway. So uh, the country's dramatically changed. And uh, one thing I would just close with, I was, I was on a flight to Hanoi or coming back from Hanoi to Saigon. And by the way, um, they don't call it Ho Chi Minh City over there. They call it Saigon. And your luggage has SGN on it. So, But this young man was telling me, he said, you know, you guys lost the war maybe, but, you know, the Americans are widely respected here. And he said, I think some of the entrepreneurial spirit uh, that you guys had rubbed off in the South because he said the south, southern part of our country is the dynamic part of our country. It's the production part. It's where a lot of the industry is. And he said... So it's, it's changed. It didn't work out the way you wanted to, but we don't think it was all for naught. So I don't know if that's gives perspective historically on this or not, but I just thought I'd share that experience I had when I did visit over there. Yeah, thank you, sir. So Vietnam to baby boomers framed and shaped our lives in ways that you, you expertly brought back to us, uh, really in the context of both our civilian and military lives and experiences, your service, and I speak to all five of you, and the service of all those who served was brilliant. And as President Reagan once quipped, and I'll remind us, uh, remind the audience that Vietnam was a war we were de denied permission to win. Thank you seems hollow and inappropriate as an expression of our nation's and audience's appreciation. For Dr. Sherwood and Commander Cutler, who wrote brilliant books on this, archiving the great stories, your great scholarship has kept the reality and history of Vietnam alive for all the generations to come. And for that, you know, we owe you a great debt of gratitude. For our audience, uh, buy these books, read them, they're brilliant. Um, you can get them on uh, Naval Institute Press. And in fact, uh, Commander Cutler works <laughs> at the Naval Institute. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm a, I practically have an allotment, you know, to the bookstore there. <laughs> Um, please consider joining our Naval Historical Foundation to enjoy more content like our webinars, our Thursday tidings, and our pull together publications. We really have a heart for telling the right story in the most personal and historically relevant uh, manner. We use scholarship of authors like Dr. Sherwood and Tom Cutler, but we also use the personal <laughs> collections of the great gentlemen today, Admiral Robinson, C Captain Krulis and, uh, and, and Mr. Uh, Kidder. Next month, we're excited to present a scholarly and personal reflection, including Royal Navy uh, participation on Lord Horatio Nelson, his leadership lessons, his brilliant career, and expert use of strategy and tactics. It's gonna be one for the ages. June features our annual meeting where we will take a great look and a deep dive on the Navy's Fighter Weapons School Top Gun its history and present, and we need you to join us. And so please do. Join our, our foundation, uh, life membership, $1,000, uh, annual membership, $50, but you get a lot of content. Again, we thank our panel. We thank you, our audience, and we remember with somber grief and, and deepest affection those service members who gave their lives in Vietnam of all services. That's all for now. God bless you all, and we'll see you next month.
ישראל.